Доброе утро, дамы и господа. Здорово. Я не говорю по-русски, so let's continue in English. <laughs> okay, so my name is Janos, but you can pronounce it Janos, Janos, whatever you want, as long as I understand that you mean me. Uh, today we're going to talk about a very Russian project, Docker. You didn't know that was Russian, right? There's a lot of Russian stuff in there, so let's talk about that. But first, what, what is it that I do? Uh, I work for a company called A1 Digital in Austria, and together with uh, Welcome in Belarus, we are uh, deploying a cloud offering in Belarus. So if you're interested in that, then please go to welcomedata.by. Um, they will deploy this in, in a couple of months, I believe, and I can give you a contact to them if you want to do some early testing on that. So, yay for Belarusian cloud. Personally, um, this is my website. Just to make it confusing, it's myname.at. It's just kind of hard to type. There's a lot more stuff on, on Docker, clean code, and those kinds of things there. So if you want to learn more, then just go there. I also have a little Discord channel, so if you have any questions afterwards or you run into any issues, then please feel free to contact me. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? First of all, what are even containers? So when we talk about, oh yeah, Docker, Kubernetes, Mesos, whatever, then we often talk about containers, but I think that very few people actually talk about what containers are. And we're going to go over a little bit of containerization history, and then I'll explain why I said that this is a Russian project. We are going to talk about Linux capabilities. So Linux capabilities are one of the many measures how Docker, for example, talks to the Linux kernel and how it runs our applications. Uh, we're going to talk about Linux namespaces, again, one of the features of, uh, of the Linux kernel, cgroups, and seccom. And finally, we're going to talk about app armor. And in the end, I have a little demo. If the demo gods are with me, then I can demonstrate all these measures. Um, the source code is in GitHub, so you can try it out yourself if you're feeling brave. First of all, before we start, this talk is going to be only about containers on Linux. So we're not going to talk about Windows containers. There are native containers on Windows. They work a little differently, though. The concept is the same. Um, the second is, as I said, my demo is for the brave only. So if you run it on your laptop and you break it, I'm not responsible for it. There's definitely stuff in there that you can do to, to break your laptop. And finally, we're going to simplify a couple of things to make it easier to understand. So let's get started. What are even containers? If we deploy our application into a container, is it secure? Can we trust that it's going to be running as we think it's going to be running? How do these things work? Initially, when we wrote a computer program back in the 80s, our computer program would run directly on the hardware. Initially with punch cards, so you would have to write your computer program, then you would give it to a lady with a typewriter. She, she would then type the punch card up, and then you would go to the big machine, feed it the, the punch cards, and then they just said, okay, it's gonna work, and yeah, they realized that this is actually a bad idea, so they skipped PHP 6. Anyway, so back to the matter at hand. So originally when you had a large mainframe and you wanted to run your program on it, the only thing that would be running on that mainframe was your program. So you would feed it the input data, you would feed it the program, it would run it, you would get the output on a printer that made horrible noises, and that's the end of story. And then the next person would come with their program and they had 15 minutes to run their code, they would run the code, they would get their output and they would leave. So well, it's a very basic form of multitasking. But as the computers got more and more powerful, we uh, had to invent some solution because not only that uh, we didn't run just one program at any time, but our machines got too powerful to run even a dozen programs at a time. So how do you separate these programs? If you run MS-DOS, computer games and stuff, then you re will remember that it was a, basically a single process operating system. It was only running that one game, apart from mouse driver and sound card driver, if you're lucky enough. But in Windows 3.1 and the, uh, the early operating systems, they introduced something called the kernel. And the CPU would help with that. This kernel made it possible 
that we could now run multiple programs and these programs would switch with multiple times within a second from one program to the other and they were protected from each other so the kernel the operating system kernel would take care of this program has this memory space that program has that memory space and they couldn't write into the memory space of each other and that is important because that way each program could rely on that nobody would mess up their data and the programmers couldn't make mistakes if you work on a modern Linux system and you've ever seen a segmentation fault that's exactly what it is a program uh, a computer bug that some program tried to write into the memory space of another program and the kernel prevented that or more precisely the CPU prevented that and then told the kernel hey this program wants to access that memory space and the kernel said nope you can't do that now what are then containers let's imagine this is our text editor okay when this text editor wants to open a file the file is on the disk and the disk is not directly accessible to this process and this is important because otherwise every every program could just write whatever they want on the disk so this this program then has to talk to the Linux kernel to hey can you please open this foo slash bar file and then the Linux kernel goes to the disk opens the file gives the data back so on and so forth normally on the old school Linux kernels you would then have a second program that would say open foo slash bar and the Linux kernel would open the very same file so under the same path you can then see the same file no matter in which program you look however in containerization what, it, what, what is happening is that we can run a program in a container this is the modern name for it it's basically just saying hey there's a different file system and then the same path for the two programs would mean different files so that way we have separated the two programs from each other in terms of file system and this is a very old technology you might know this as chroot now in containerization specifically in docker there are multiple ways of separating programs from each other one is the mount namespace and mounting means that you can have different devices you can or, uh, mount a network device in one process that is not seen by anyone else or you can access different parts of the file system there's a user namespace that means that even though you are a root user in a container you're not necessarily a root user on the host machine and this is important because the root user on the host machine can for example reboot it in the early days of docker there was actually a bug in docker that if you hit said reboot in a container it would reboot the host machine which is well could be a problem we have UTS which is the server name so you can give your com you can make it such that your containers see a different server name you can give it a different host name than what you have on the host machine you can give it a different network namespace this means that your containers your applications that are running in your container can have their own network device and cannot for example send packets in the name of the host machines IP address there is whole architectures around networking in con containerization you can have different process IDs so this the process ID namespace is very important because as you will see in the demo the is inside the container you cannot see any process outside the container but from outside you can see the container uh, the process is running in the container and there's a lot more to to this so this is a basic overview of, of what's happening here so if you for example a couple of years ago went for something oh my machine is too big I want to run multiple things what you would do you uh, you would virtualize virtualization means that you would have one host OS on your hardware and then you would talk to your CPU via some sort of virtualization technique to run a guest operating system and the guest operating system would have its own kernel it could run its own programs and generally would run everything that belongs to an operating system for example it would run you a syslog server your monitoring application so on and so forth this means that every virtual machine had a quite significant cost so it could run maybe 10 20 virtual machines per server but that's about it now in containerization you do not have a separate kernel for the guest so to speak you also do not have a full operating system so normally containers do not run a log server they do not run a monitoring so on and so forth they just run that one program that you put in the container of course it needs libraries so when you build your docker files the folks who were in my docker workshop saw this then you would use ubuntu but just out of convenience because it, you have the libraries that for example php or nginx needs there but technically if you're a go programmer you can just take your one program that you have compiled 
put it in a container with nothing else in it and it will just run inside of a container. The kernel is the same, so the magic is actually happening in the kernel here. And of course, if you're using other technologies, for example, you want to run an, uh, a not-so-safe payload, you could use Intel Clear containers to actually use the virtualization technique despite just running one program, but the point is, one program can be its own container. So what happens if you do this? Docker run traffic. Traffic, is, by the way, is a very wonderful reverse proxy. It does Let's Encrypt for you, has lots of backends. So if you want to deploy a reverse proxy in a Dockerized environment, I would thoroughly recommend traffic. If we look at the process list, then what we see is first we have a Docker D. So this is the Docker daemon. Then we have a container D. This is the runtime that's running the container. Container D shim for good measure, and then we have our program in there. So this is how it looks from the outside. Now from the inside, you just see this. So if you look from the inside of the container, you see nothing of the outside processes or the containerization engine. You just see that you have one program running and that's traffic. Okay, so containers are basically, containers don't exist. They're not a technology, they're a collection of technologies. They're comprised of capabilities. These are Linux capabilities. We'll talk about those in a second. Linux namespaces, seccom for uh, filtering, AppArmor, Linux, and so on and so forth. And as I said, a bunch of other smaller technologies. So let's go over how containerization was actually created. If you've been around in 2006, 7, so, so on and so forth, you might have seen these projects. And OpenVZ, uh, is actually was created in Russia. The company was American, but the development and research office was here in Moscow. vServer and uh, Linux vServer, I believe, was Austrian, so it's still maintained by an Austrian guy. And Oracle Solaris uh, containers actually have nothing to do with containerization today. They just borrowed the name from Oracle Solaris. Solaris, uh, as far as I know, is actually a pretty dead project. Now, the only project that actually lived on was OpenVZ because the OpenVZ developers actively pushed uh, stuff into the Linux kernel. They wanted to get the whole OpenVZ in, but it was actually these companies who took the OpenVZ apart, which was the forefather of today's uh, containerization. They took uh, the different parts from the containerization apart and submitted them to the Linux kernel one by one. For example, Google submitted the uh, C groups if you, if you know these, these are resource limits in the Linux kernel. Those uh, were inspired by the OpenVZ user bean counters. And actually, I have to give a massive thank you to Kirill Kolchkin um, for helping me put this together because it was very hard to dig up the history of, uh, of containerization. And now that we have all these features in the Linux kernel, that's where all the containerization technologies came from. So, Docker, Kubernetes, Mesos, uh, LXC, and so on and so forth. If you are interested in some more history, then I recommend this talk, A Brief History of Containers by Jeff Victor and Kiel Kroshkin. Uh, it's very interesting. You can go back and watch the whole history. Now let's talk about capabilities. So in Linux, can you run ping as a normal user? So who, who thinks that you can run ping as a normal user? Who thinks that you cannot run ping as a normal user? Everyone else has no opinion. So what's happening here is that in order to run ping, you need actually root permissions because you need to build a raw network packet to run a ping. In Linux, you have this uh, flag called suid, which means that you can run it as a non-root user, but technically you do need root permissions. However, the Linux developers realized that root, ro having root permissions for everything is not a viable way because sometimes you just need to do this thing or you need to do that thing. So they split the root permissions up. One of these permissions, for example, this is how a, a ping command looks if you look at it in Linux and it's red because the suid bit is on it. So one of these permissions is capnet raw. If you have a process that is not running as root but it has this capability, capnet raw, then it can send a raw packet. If you're running a process as root, but you do not have this, uh, this bit set, then it doesn't matter that you're root. You cannot send, uh, send a ping packet. 
CapNet Admin lets you administer network interfaces. For example, add new IP addresses or remove IP addresses. So on and so forth. And why is this important? Why do we need to care? Because, for example, if you want to run OpenVPN in your Docker container, then you actually need CapNet Raw and CapNet Admin. And if you don't know that these capabilities exist and why you need them, then you cannot run OpenVPN. So these are basically, when we run our container, we base uh, on top of the default set that Docker gives this container, you also give the container these capabilities. CapChown lets you change the owner of any file even if you're non-root. CapKill lets you kill any process. Fun stuff there. CapNet bind service lets you start a web server on ports below 1024. So for example, if you wanted to run a Tomcat server, which normally runs on port 8080, you wanted to run it on port 80, then you would need this capability. You don't have to, you can of course use proxies and stuff, but if you wanted to run it on port 80, this is what you need. You don't need root permissions for this. Cap set UID set kid lets you change the current user of the process. Um, Capsys ch root lets you change the root file system pointer. This is what we talked about. This is what we talked about when I said, okay, we have the file system, but now we want to switch where the file system points. Ch root is what lets you do that. Capsys nights lets you set the priorities of a uh, of a process. So how nice it plays when the Linux kernel needs to decide which process to run. It's very important if you have a very CPU hungry application but you do not want it to clog down your server then you could use this nice uh, permission to change the permission uh, the CPU scheduling okay so how do you use this let's say you're a C programmer you want to use this I have a little bit of bad news there are three ways of doing it and none of them are really working all that well so let's take a look at a little bit of C code this is my program and I'm using cap ng here so cap ng clear uh, and cap and g apply. Basically, I'm clearing all capabilities and then I'm applying the, the current set. And then I start a shell there. And even though I'm root in this process, I still cannot do anything. For example, I cannot ping a uh, web address because I cleared all my capabilities. Unfortunately, it's really hard to actually implement this, so you will have to dive deep in the Linux kernel with PRCTL and uh, those kinds of things. So that's uh, that's a fun project, but it's good for demonstration purposes. If you wanted to implement your own containerization engine, well, good luck with that. Okay, let's talk about Linux namespaces. A little bit of, uh, of an example. If you have learned how f the fork command works, this is going to be similar. We're going to be uh, doing a little stack magic here, so I'm not going to elaborate that because it's actually just some technical code. And the important part is the clone system call. So, I'm going to call a child function and the, what the clone system call does, it starts a new process. And I'm going to start a new process in this program with this function that I'm specifying there. I'm giving, going to give it a stack for variables. And this is the most important part. I'm going to say new namespace and I'm going to say new network. So I'm going to start, I'm going to start a child process with a new network namespace. That means that the child process does no longer see the network stack of the host operating system, but it only sees its own network interfaces. And then I can create virtual network interfaces and connect them via virtual cables and that all that goodness. And then some parameters which we don't need here. And then we wait for the child to finish and that's basically our uh, containerization engine right there. So this child function is basically, you could write your program here, you could start another program, whatever you prefer. So the clone command, the clone system call in Linux, starts a new namespace for network, for mount, for whatever you want. The unshare lets you join an existing namespace. Uh, no, sorry, the, puts the existing process that you have, so it doesn't create a new process, it lets you put the existing process in a new namespace. And the set ns lets you join a namespace. And this is important because you can actually run one Docker container, have something running there, and if you need to debug that container, you can actually start a second container and say, okay, join the namespaces of that container, for example, the network namespace, but with better capabilities, 
So you can TCP dump, for example, on your existing running container without having to have TCP dump and all your tools in that container. I'm going to show you in a moment how. So I'm just going to say target and pass a container name or container ID there. I'm going to say docker run and I have a little image there. This is my debug container, which I haven't updated in about a year or so. And then I'm going to say, okay, please join the PID and network namespaces of that other container. So I have my web server running and I want to debug it. And I'm just going to start a new container and have it join that other container. And I'm going to give it more capabilities. So this way I can now trace my running container without actually having to touch it. Let's talk about C groups. These are resource limits. If you look on a modern system with Docker, you will see things like this. Uh, if you run the mount command, you will see that there is a file system path that is called C group. And in this case, I'm looking at a CPU set. If I put a process in a C group, then every process in that uh, C group will have, for example, the same amount of CPU shares applied to it. So it's kind of a nice way of grouping uh, resources on your uh, on your machine. So you put your one container in one C group and then you can say, okay, you get maximum 10% of the CPU and that's it. So all the processes in there have to fight for those 10% of CPU, but they cannot affect any other containers on your uh, operating system. You can use the CG create command on Linux to create a C group. For example, here I'm creating a CPU and CPU accounting C group called my group. Then I'm going to put a process with the process ID there into that C group, so CG classify. So I'm moving that process in there. And then I'm going to say, for example, this C group can only run on core number two. So now that process that's running in that container can only run in core number two. And if I put more processes in those, then all those processes in that C group have to fight for that one core. Uh, there is a couple of C groups. Um, CPU set, I will have to hurry up so we have time for the demo. These are the shares, so how, how much time uh, the processes get out of 100%, um, how much time they can exactly do. So you can do uh, microsecond scheduling with C groups. You, you can do memory limits, mem more memory limits. You can throttle disk I.O. Uh, and then let's go on to seccom. So until now, we've dealt only with, OK, accessing something using resources. What we haven't limited are the system calls. So, as I said, when a program wants to access some data, then it cannot directly uh, go to the disk and, and read it because the CPU is going to say, nope, that doesn't work. So instead, uh, whoops, slides. So instead, what's going to happen is that the program tries to access the disk and that gets redirected to the Linux kernel. And then the Linux kernel actually accesses the disk. And this is called a system call. And obviously there are dangerous system calls, so you want, we want to limit them. And seccomp is a way of doing that. So in this case, again, a little program code, we initialize the seccomp with a, with a default setting called allow. And then we add a rule to, for example, forbid the bind system call. So this pro program can then no longer open a port to, to run a web server, for example. And then we load the profile, and then you will, our process will basically not be able to, to bind to a, um, uh, to a port. The last item in our list is App Armor. App Armor is the default, for example, in Ubuntu. This allows you to create a more comprehensive profile. For example, you can say deny network raw. So it's kind of similar to what we've talked about before, um, but basically this says, okay, this container cannot open raw network sockets, or this container cannot mount, or uh, this a container cannot access sysrq trigger, which is the reboot thing that I talked about before. So this is actually the default in uh, Docker installations nowadays because you do not want your guest container to be able to reboot the host machine. And that's also why it is very important that you do not just randomly start containers in privileged mode if you have permission problems, because that basically means that your container is running on the host, host operating system. You can change capabilities and that's the part where we finish before the demo. Now, about this demo. So this is up on GitHub, but I don't know if you know Mythbusters, but yeah. Uh, I wouldn't recommend trying this at home. This is definitely not production grade code, but let's take a look at it. If you want to look at this, uh, at the code, this is on, up on GitHub, so github.com slash my weird nickname. 
Um, you can download it and compile it. Please do it in a virtual machine. Oh, oops, we're not there yet. So we're going to take this little wake up. Um, so you can see I have, a, I have a little bit of a project here. And what you see here is, I don't know if you can see that uh, from back there. So there is a demo folder. And this demo folder has various uh, sample implementations, for example, for namespaces. And what I would recommend on GitHub, you can actually read uh, the README, freshly installed virtual machine. So the README in these, uh, if you look at it, explains how these work. So the individual parts are explained in great detail. So if you look at these, then, um, then uh, you, can, you can actually learn a lot about these. And you can, of, of course, also look at the source code. Let's take a look in a demo and namespaces. And let's take a look at the PID namespace. That's actually safe to run. So if you look at my process list on the host machine, I'm running PSAWFX. There's a lot of processes. And now I'm running this uh, demo namespaces PID program. And if I now run PSAWF, uh, AUWFX, then I do not see anything. So this one process, you can see from the path is still running on the host machine, but it can no longer see the processes of that host machine. So this is a shell that's running in a container that only has the restrictions for processes applied to it. Similarly, if you look at the network namespace, if I do if config on this machine, you can see that I have uh, network interfaces. If I run the demo namespaces net, and then run if config, nothing here. Actually, you, you can see if config minus a, there is an LO interface, but even that is not brought up. So the process still has access to everything on the host machine, but it does not have access to the network interfaces of the host machine. Exit out of this. Let's take a look at a more comprehensive example because we're rapidly running out of time. So if I go into the runtime, this is actually everything put together. So the demo runtime actually gives a little bit of help. And there is a test container included with this project. And if I now run this, this is a container that I've built by hand. I'm now inside of a container of my own making. And you can see there is no processes. I don't know if this even works. Yes, it does. So basically, I cannot see any network interfaces. And I'm inside of an, an Alpine Linux installation that is basically in an image file on the host machine. So the host, the host machine doesn't even see this file system. I have mounted it purely for the purposes of this container. And that's the end of it. So if you want to take a look at this, I recommend that you run this on a virtual machine and, uh, and try this out yourself. There are some build instructions because this is written in uh, C++. And with that, I will we switch over to Slido. If there are any questions. I'm just going to wait for a moment. Or you can also sh uh, shout questions, but then the translation won't work. OK, if there are no questions, um, please feel free to uh, find me later on here at the, at the conference. I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you might have. And I'm also happy to go into the source code in a little more detail. Uh, thank you for your attention. Спасибо. Больше спасибо.